Alright, JBarb78 here again. Back for the second part of my uh, tutorial walkthrough on painting Masterpiece Sideswipe. Uh, taking off from where I left off before. I got everything in primer now. Um, with the primer set up and double checked everything to make sure. We went through last time with the wet sanding and whatnot. Um, you'll notice now, more or less, that this thing will focus in. that most of our low spots are nice and covered now we don't have any divots in there or dimples or anything or any perfections in the mold left uh, thankfully this figure came pretty well uh, I guess you could say it's pretty close to perfect as far as the ones that I've come across um, some of you guys might be familiar with uh, my shattered glass Rodimus Prime and also Stepper where I did them in black um, with the gloss black especially, any of those imperfections would show through and stick out like a sore thumb. So, gone through and sanded these things up really good and tried to eliminate the majority of them. I haven't really come across any more of them, but when we do this next step, you'll see, you know, they'll start to show through a little bit. Um, and start putting on paint. So, uh, again, I'm going to stick with stuff you guys can readily find at most hobby stores. Um, generally I tend to paint with the uh, House of Color paints because as you can see I've got quite a lot of it um, but since it's unavailable I'm gonna stick with things that you guys can readily find and use. So I'm gonna be using uh, this is the testers model master uh, custom lacquer system. Um, I haven't really used a whole lot of this yet. Um, I have used this particular one before. It is, it's pretty nice stuff. Um, if you guys like using lacquer paints, I do recommend these. They are pretty nice. Um, most of the time for my lacquers, I'll use the House of Color, and then also uh, I use. Generally, I stick to all clad for primers and clear, basically because you know the the price point on those things is pretty good. You can get them fairly inexpensive, and they last quite a while. Um, but I'll go over thinning and whatnot, try and get you guys as up to speed as possible. Um, this one, thankfully, is already pretty thin. You don't need to thin it too much. Um, again, you're going for the consistency of milk, and what that means is you can kind of see in here it's it's wet. It's not real thick. Um, if it was too thick, when I pull this out, it would beat up on this stick. Whereas here it's soaking in and kind of wicking up a little bit, um, and it's not transparent. I mean, if it was up on top of here and you could see through it, um, then it's too thin. Uh, this is pretty much right about the consistency you want to be airbrushing in, especially if you're going for that, that high gloss look. Um, same with your clears as well. You want your clears this thin. And generally I find that most of the paints when I get them out of the jar are going to require quite a bit of thinner. Sometimes I've even gone as far as dumping half of the paint out of the jar, you know, brand new, into another jar. And then thinning them, I'll end up with two jars of paint from one off of the shelf, which is a bonus, you know, it saves you some money on buying more paint. Uh, but, so we're going to go ahead and start shooting these. Set up. Again, you want to be shooting at about 20 to 25 psi. Um, too high a pressure, you'll push too much volume of paint. You get a lot of turbulence, and you'll start to see a lot more of your orange peel. Just the same as you would spraying it too thick. Um, a lot of times, what will happen is you spray too thick. Um, two things will happen. Number one, you're going to get a coat thicker than you want, um, and you won't know that you have proper coverage. It'll be uneven, and you'll start to see runs and uh, imperfections again that you'll be creating yourself with paint. Um, and again, with the transformers, you know, and having these tight tolerances, you don't want the paint too thick, otherwise it will chip. And if you do it too thin, then obviously it's just going to be nothing but thinner sprayed onto here, and it'll take you forever just to get it coated. So, um, you'll also 
I've taken the parts that I don't want red paint on and put them away. That way I can avoid overspray. Um, and there's some of these parts here that are going to have secondary colors on them, uh, black or white or whatever. Um, I'll probably go through when I respray those um, and mask those off. And I'll try and get a couple shots of that. But for the most part, I'll just do a couple, a couple parts really quick so you can see my, how I do this. Um, I'll start with this one here. And just like with the primer, you want to start with your edges first. And we're just going to do a light coat first, just a tack coat. Should normally take about uh, usually about three coats to completely coat a part. So that's a tack coat. Just a really light coat to start off. Again, we aim for the edges first. Trying to get some of the inside ones as well. get a couple of different pieces here so you can see um, and then this piece for example um, this part I just shot right here is more or less going to be hidden um, I try to avoid overcoating those especially if it's a part like this one um, this rear body piece it'll fit up inside of there and it actually will pivot in here so I try to not coat this too much. I don't want it too heavy in there because it'll it'll be prone to chipping and rubbing off when that piece moves in and out as you transform it. So, uh, all your edges. This part right here where I've clipped on, it's not going to be seen, it's actually hidden inside of there. Um, whenever I clip, I try to look for those parts so that you know I don't have that sticking out later. And if there is nowhere that you can grip on, you can always just avoid painting this whole area on the first pass, then unclip it and clip it somewhere else, and then coat it. Pretty much just go through that one by one, get them all shot with your first tack coat, and then with lacquer, I tend to give it about a 15 minute rest period in between so that it'll flash. Uh, what flashing means basically is for the, uh, you're giving the carrier in the paint, or the lacquer thinner in this case, time to evaporate out. Um, you don't want to wait too long, because the surface of this, they have, uh, I mean, the terminology is either it's open or it's closed it's open the thinner is evaporated out more or less and the surface hasn't 
totally settled down and flattened out yet. Um, and that's when they call the recoat window. So you want to try to shoot in between that, that time period. Uh, otherwise, if it closes and it completely settles and flattens out and cures, you'll have to come back and sand this up again to paint it again and get the paint to stick. Um, not so much generally with lacquer. Like I said, it is a uh, potter solvent, so what it'll do essentially is it melts itself into every uh, successive layer as you put it on. Um, but you do want to allow it enough time to flash and get that, that carrier out of there. Otherwise, you can have a weaker coat. You know, you're building on top of a wet coat, and it'll dry more at the top than it will at the bottom, and it'll, it'll cause chipping issues later. So I'm going to go ahead and paint all these, and then we'll pick up again at the second coat. All right, time for coat number two. Start with the same one here. This one you can go a little bit heavier, a little bit more of your trigger pull. Again, not too wet. Keep it in frame here. And you should be able to see by now that this thing is pretty flat, straight. Uh, again. You don't have to go through all that sanding if this isn't the look you're going for, but if it is, that's what's necessary. Uh, I got my pressure tube. building up slowly. You only want just enough paint on there to, to get coverage. So it's going to get a little tricky. Having these on the stick so I can move them around, get in everywhere. That's the second coat. Should only take one more to get this thing where I want it. Uh, one more on the hood here. I'm still spraying light. Um, I don't want to lay down a really heavy wet coat just yet. Um, for my final, my third coat, I'll lay it on a little bit wetter and then you'll see you know, how flat the surface is. But it's getting there. So I'm going to go ahead and finish these off and pick it up with the third coat. Alright, here we go for round three. This will be the last coat. Um, 
I switched airbrushes. My other one was having a tip clogging issue, and I don't have enough acetone to clean that out, so I'll have to do that when we go on to the next colors, but this should be more or less ready to go. So this will be the wetter coat. This will be the last one. Now you can see pretty close to a glossy finish. Um, once I do the red, all this, everything totally done with the red, then I'll shoot a, a quick shot of clear over it just to seal it off so when I mask and do the other colors, you know, if there's any overspray or anything bleeds through, I can clean it up without damaging the red paint. I'm getting pretty close to a, a good gloss finish with this. That's where thinning the paint comes in handy. Um, helps it kind of lay out flat. And then also it helps with the evaporating, getting that thinner out like I was talking about earlier. Again, we don't want to shoot too thick, just enough to coat. See, I'm pretty much where I want to be with the color on the third coat. So I'm going to go through and finish these up, and I'll come back for the first shot of clear. Alright, so time to wrap up at least this coat anyway. Uh, the red. What I'm going to do here, since this has had enough time to flash, I'm going to go ahead and shoot a quick sealer coat over it. The um, reason I do this is because uh, most of these parts are going to have secondary colors painted over them, so I'm going to be masking the red. And again, like I said, mentioned earlier, um, I want to protect the red so that if there is any kind of overspray or any mistakes, that I can remove them without removing the red and having to shoot this all over again. Um, so I'm going to do just a quick shot of clear. Uh, what I'm using is uh, all clad gloss clear coat. Uh, this is a clear lacquer. As you can see, it's, it's pretty thin, straight from the from the factory. You don't have to add anything to this again. Um, I'll be spraying again 20 and 25 psi still. Uh, I'm just gonna lay down one quick coat over this, and then uh, I'll move on to my next colors after that. Uh, but I do recommend this stuff. This is a pretty good clear, it's pretty durable, um, and it gets nice and glossy if you lay it down right. So, I'm going to do this real quick. Start with the hood. Make sure my pressure is right That's where I want it. Um, I'll be shooting more coats of clear, but uh, I'm only going to hit the insides of these once. They really don't need to have a whole lot of clear. Again, it's a rub spot, so the, the less paint you put on these, the better. And you can see that it, it goes on very minimal effort, so you don't want to put too heavy. And still, even at 20 psi, you should still be moving your hand pretty pretty quickly. This stuff is very strong, so I'm gonna try to minimize how long I spray without a respirator here because this stuff is pretty nasty. And you can 
see. Pretty nice and glossy by now. Um, there's still a little bit of an orange peel texture to it. Uh, again, we're going to be adding more clear to this, and then we're going to sand it off when we do the buffing process. So it'll be about this thick by the time I'm done with all the final sanding and, and buffing. But that's about as thick as you want a clear coat on these things. Again, because of the chipping and rubbing issues. Um, if you weren't going to go through the whole buffing process, I would say stop with this much clear on there. Um, you can see it's not a bad looking clear coat. Uh, but again, I don't care for the orange peel. I'm pretty particular about that. So I'm going to try and buff that out. And if I were to buff it from here, I run the risk of actually sanding through the clear coat into the red and possibly down to the plastic or the primer. And that's not a good thing. So I'm going to go ahead and shoot all these and then I'll pick up for the next step. Alright, so I got a, a good cure on this clear lacquer that I've got on here. Um, what I'm going to do might seem a little out of order to some. But there's a reason I do it this way. Um, what I'm going to do right now real quick is I'm going to hit the panel lines on the alt mode. Uh, reason being, the more clear that you add on top of this, it will also kind of tend to work its way down into these panel lines and they won't be quite as sharp or defined. Um, I'm also going to be doing some more wet sanding in here so any mistakes that I'm not able to wipe off, I'm going to be able to sand off now before I put more clear on top of this. Um, and I'm going to be using this uh, Create Effects acrylic enamel wash. Um, some of you guys might have already seen my panel lining tutorial. Uh, pretty, pretty well detailed on what I'm doing with this stuff and then also my little homemade rat tail brush that I've got right here. Um, but I'm basically, I'm only concerned with alt mode parts for right now. The rest of them I'm going to hit later. Uh, just also so that these things don't get too dark. I notice a lot of times when when panel lining gets done on the cars like this, if it's too dark and uh, or too thick or even too wide, uh, it tends to look a little off in my opinion. So that's why I do these now. So I'll show you all real quick. brush in there. So let me move this over a little. So I'm going to go ahead and hit these lines. You notice I'm not making them too heavy. I want them as fine as possible. And again, the reason I'm doing this this way is that I don't want to lose these lines once they get full of clear. And if you make a mistake, it's not too critical at this point. Again, you're going to wet sand the, the raised surface of this. So anything that gets on there, if there's any smudges or something that you can't easily wipe off, it's going to go away with the sanding. too sharp of a black line. This stuff's pretty thin which is nice so it'll more or less be just a extremely dark red and it will be a sharp black line. And if you haven't seen my panel lining tutorial the reason I use this longer brush like this no matter where the panel line is and no matter how much my hands gonna shake with that little bit of flex to the brush it's gonna ride that line and I'm not trying to keep my hand perfectly steady which I mean I can do but this way is a bit more forgiving so I'm just gonna go through these one by one and hit every line that I can hit 
Again, only on the outside. So I'll go through and hit all these and move on to the next step. Okay, so now that I've got my panel lines done, um, you'll notice that where I did the badge also, right in here, um, I've got the, the panel lining done around that now, and then what I'm going to do in between clear coats, because some of these badging details, and you'll notice I've already gone through and kind of detailed out the side markers here, uh, a lot of them are going to have two colors to them. Um, the way I do it, especially with the side markers themselves, I, I generally tend to back those with either chrome silver or white, uh, depending on what's going on with those. Uh, these particular ones, you'll, if you notice, they have a, uh, a bezel that's set up around the lens for the side marker, and those are generally in chrome or silver, if you look at the any reference pictures of the car itself. So what I'll do is once I spray the clear over this and I've got a barrier between the silver and the orange I could paint the orange on top of the clear on the next coat of clear and then afterwards you know I'll wet sand again um, you'll notice I do a lot of wet sanding but um, that way it acts as a barrier between the two colors so you're not reactivating it by putting enamel back on top of enamel which sometimes it can reactivate it and even with silver um, it, it loses the reflective quality versus just mixing in the orange on that it just turns into a muddy orange so um, I'm gonna go through and do all of those now as well um, as well as I believe there's some some fog lamps that are detailed under here I'll probably do those in silver now and then uh, the same with the the, the reverse indicator lights on the back end, which is generally the one on the inside here. Uh, I'll do it silver now, and then after a coat of clear, I'll probably do like a really thin white over it. And then uh, the one on the, the outside here, the brake lights, those will get stoplight red metallic uh, testers enamel. And that particular color looks a little bit better when it's airbrushed, so I'll probably have to mask this entire thing to spray that. but. Um, and then also uh, the door handles on these panels here you notice right there I'll hit that in black so I'm gonna go through and do those really quick and you'll notice again like I said I'm using my my rat tail brush the same one that I use for panel lining uh, generally it, it gives you a little bit better lines especially like right in here where you don't want to go beyond your panel line that you've already done you get a little bit more control of it that way so I'll go ahead and do all those next okay so all my secondary details are all done as far as the red alt mode parts that are going to remain red uh, you see I've done my panel lining I've done the blackout in between right here for the, uh, the headlight bucket um, the badge undercoat for the badge and then also the uh, side markers here and the tail lights have all been done uh, so now it's time to mask these parts off so that I can spray the flat black on the underside um, this particular piece also this is the only spot that I'm going to keep red is on the air dam here everything else is going to be black and then uh, I'll, put, I'll mask off and paint the wheels afterwards those will go gloss black and then the, the, the metallic overcoat on it and then uh, I'll probably mask and do this last. Um, I'm planning on doing this in all clad, either chrome or aircraft aluminum. I haven't decided yet. But this is where it gets a little tricky is trying to decide what order to do this in. Uh, generally what I tend to do is anything that's going to remain gloss I'll do first. So. Um, when I do this hood, you know, obviously I don't really need to mask the underside of this. I could just spray the top and it won't get gloss paint underneath. Um, and this is going to remain all flat, so I don't need to worry about that. But on this particular piece, I'll show it right here, um, this is going to get gloss 
and this underneath here is going to remain flat black. Um, I did a little bit of research. The uh, Lamborghini Countach, the LP500S, which is what this is more or less based off of. Uh, the underside of the deck lid is all black. And then, originally I thought these might be Lexan windows on the real car, but they're not. They're just vents. So I'm going to paint those in flat black. Uh, but I believe this is a window. This will be like a Lexan window, so I want that gloss. So I'm going to mask all this off to paint this black, leave everything else red, and then I'll do the flat black after my final clear coat so that I can get the, the contrast between the two. I like to have a little bit of mixed, uh, mixed finishes here and there for a little bit of extra pop. So these will be done last after my final clear coat. Um, and again, it, it, it's a little tricky. Sometimes you have to be creative and try and figure out what order you're going to do things in. Like these, this is going to get all black. The underside of this I want to have black. Um, so what I may end up doing with this particular piece, I may coat this in a, a liquid mask, which this is the one that I use. It's a micro mask, liquid masking. You just brush this on and leave it. And the beauty of this is it's water soluble. So when I'm finished, to take this off rather than sit there and try and scrape and peel it all you have to do is drop it in a bucket of warm water and this will just dissolve and it'll go away um, it's really nice this is great mainly for uh, enamels and lacquers uh, if you're spraying water-based paint like acrylics uh, you don't want to use this because if it gets wet with water it'll actually dissolve and the acrylic will bleed through but this is a handy little product to have for the most part I use I typically use this uh, I think it's quarter inch uh, Tamiya tape I find that it's good for conforming to surfaces it's kind of flexible a little bit too so you could press it down into recesses and it'll stay it won't pull back up on you um, I use a kind of a variety of different tapes uh, for the most part though I also use uh, frog tape which is more or less the same material as this Tamiya tape but obviously it's much bigger you can cover a wider area with it. Um, and then anytime when I do this I'll mask the perimeter first with the Tamiya tape and then I'll come back over it double mask with this. Um, I usually only leave maybe in a sixteenth of an inch or, or you know at least 50% overlap on the other tape so they don't get overspray and that this doesn't, you know, allow paint to bleed through. And if it's a really large area, then I'll use uh, masking paper against this tape. But these parts are pretty small, so I don't think I'm going to need to do that. And then, let's see, which other one's here? Pretty much everything else is just going to get straight coats. I don't have to do a whole lot of masking here, thankfully. Um, but I decided to change gears a bit. I uh, decided to scrap the broken canopy piece. I ordered another figure so that I can get the canopy off of it. So when that shows up, I'll show you how I do uh, masking for windshields. And uh, show you how I get the contrast that I do on those. Um, so for now, I'll we'll start with uh, this hood real quick. I'll just do a quick run through on this. Um, I'll keep a pair of scissors handy. I like to have straight edges on my cuts. That way if, if there's something that I want to mask right up to and stop it at it, for example right here, I can decide, you know, more or less. where I want to stop it and get my reveal line. Um, and then another handy tool that I keep. This, I don't know exactly what it's called. It came in a, a clay sculpting kit, but I like it because of this rounded edge. It's metal, so I can use it to press tape into uh, recessed areas like this. And because it's, I'm not using the hook, I'm using the rounded edge. I don't run the risk of marring the surface underneath. 
I've also used bamboo skewers in the past, but I find that the points on those things, they tend to wear out over time. And this part, I'm not going to be real critical about the gloves, obviously, because I've still got some wet sanding to do before clear. So once I get enough of that started, I'll leave that overlapped, and then what I'll do is just take a, a, an X-Acto knife, and very gently come along this edge and start in the middle because it's starting on the edge you can bind the tape and just trim that off sometimes you have to use both hands on the tape to keep tension And that's how I get my masked edge there. And then you can use your fingernail to kind of press it down. Again, I want to try and keep this part black for a little bit of contrast. And if if you get a little bit of this, see how this uneven cut line right here, you can come back and very gently just trim it off. You don't want to put too much pressure, just very lightly work the knife along it until you trim it. And then I'll continue that all the way around the edge and then I'll use the frog tape to cover it up. And you can see I can I can probably get away with one piece on this. So I'll go through and mask all these off and start setting up for the flat black. I'm going to try and do a quick demonstration here on how I use this little hook tool. Um, you can see I've got this piece here that has a uh, change in plane where it angles up like that on the side. Uh, what I do here, try and get it flat and close to that corner as possible. And that's where this guy comes in. I can push it in and find that line. Um, and then to get around some of these other edges, you know, once I get it up into there, um, just roll it over. If you need to make a relief cut, you know, keep your keep your knife handy. Say if you wanted to relieve it right here, you can relieve it off the corner, so that once you fold it around, you're not trying to bend around two different planes. Obviously, that's not going to happen with a piece of tape that's not completely flexible. And then if you have any exposed sections like this, you just throw a quick piece of tape over it. But then where this comes into handy is I know there's a window under there. So I use this to trace that edge and define it so I know where to cut out the masking tape. And again, you know, it's got that curved edge to it. It's not going to damage the plastic or scratch the paint underneath. So I'll find that, that line that I'm looking for all the way around. And you can see now I know where I can cut my tape. And then again, uh, you want to have a sharp blade for this if you got the the tip of these can tend to chip at, some, at times so if it does you know if, if you're using a dull blade for this you're not going to get a very good line so you want to find that line and very gently draw the knife along it just enough pressure to cut through the tape sometimes it might take a pass or two to get through it stop all the way at a corner you don't want to cut in those motions you want to do one continuous line until you go through the tape and you can feel when you when you get through it and then again start at a corner very gently allow the knife to ride in that corner until you've cut all four sides Uh, 
Now once you've got it all cut, then you can use the pointed end to start a corner. You want to try and pull up when you do this. Don't push down into it. And then I'll try and just hook the tape with that point until I can pull And then I use that rounded edge again to make sure that that tape hasn't pulled back. And that's how I mask. So I'm going to continue on with these to the rest of them and be ready for paint. Okay, so now that we've got everything coated with the black underneath. Um, I'm going to go ahead and leave this alone. I'll probably dry brush most of the black. Um, some of it's going to get a gloss coat over it for uh, all clad, uh, mainly for the feet and a couple little parts here and there. But for the most part the red is done. So what I want to do here is I'm going to try and bring this in close. You can kind of see a little bit of an orange peel texture to this. Um, I'm going to get ready to spray a final clear. There's also some dust and things like that on it because they've been sitting for a few days. So um, we're going to go ahead and get ready for final clear coats. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my 1200 again and I'm going to do a really, really light wet sand on here. I don't want to sand too much now because there is the potential to go through the, the clear coat. So I'm going to just very gently go over this and you can feel when those little divots and whatnot, or sorry, um, raised, what have you, dust, any particles or anything, any perfections that are in this clear coat that's on here now, you can feel them when they go away. It's more or less when it's time to stop sanding in that spot. But we're going to go through and try and level all those out. It's not necessary at this point to use the block. Um, if it's a larger area, it might be. But for, for the most part, we're fairly flat because of all the sanding that we've done so far prior to this. But we want to remove anything that's going to show through our final clear coat now. And like I said, any, any of your mistakes in the panel lining are going to be removed at this point. Again, be very careful of your edges. Stay away from those as much as possible. Very lightly, very gently. You don't have to get too aggressive at this point. see a little bit of red paint is coming off so we are removing a lot of the clear but the clear will fill in a lot of the imperfections in the red which is why I do that I'd rather sand through clear than the red and have to spray red again Probably should have changed my paper here, but...
can see now, I've removed a lot of the, the little ridges and raised particles of dust. There's a few spots also keeping compressed air on hand is kind of kind of vital at this point so that way you can blow any of the soap or any of the sanding particles off so that this is clean when you put paint on it and then it also helps you to show you can see where it's still shiny you might need to lightly sand those spots again but again uh, we're going to go through all of this hit everything really good and then uh, start shooting final clear and then also before I apply the clear I'll show you how I do my decal work because this is the time to do that as well. So I'm going to bury it under clear and I want to blend it in so that when the decal is set you don't see any raised edges around it. So I'm going to go through and start doing all that and then we'll pick up from there. Sanded and ready to go for clear. Uh, what I'm going to do here is start putting on decals. I really only have two of them that I'm going to do. Uh, I don't want to get too crazy with this but uh, I'm going a little bit smaller with the faction logo. I got a white one here that I'm going to use. And what I want to do for this, you need obviously you need water for the water slide decal. Let it sit. I'm going to go ahead and drop that in now while I go over everything else. Um, I use micro scale products, obviously uh, the wet mask, and then also this uh, micro set and then micro saw. Uh, this is the setting solution. It's basically the glue that's going to help the decal stick. And then the solvent you use after the decal has been set. You let the the glue dry, and then the solvent. What it does is it softens the uh, the coating that's over the top of the decal, so it'll flatten it out, and then also uh, helps to eliminate the raised edge around where you've cut the decal out. Um, you're going to need two brushes, uh, both of them they need to be fairly clean. Uh, you need one for doing the setting solution and then I use a flat brush for when I do the solvent. That way you can kind of brush the, the decal flat, flatten it out and then once you've let it dry then it's ready for clear. So I'm going to go ahead and apply the setting solution while I let that decal soak. Sometimes you got to let the decal soak for like 10 to 15 seconds. Uh, mine are kind of old. They've been in there for a while, so they need to sit a little longer. And you just want to put a real small light coat on here. Just enough for the decal to, to set on. So I'm going to go ahead and pull this out. I like to blow it somewhat dry. Try and get most of the water off of it. Let's see then that I leave it stuck to the paper like this, so I got a way to hold it. Grab this part. And then I want it centered right above that badge on the hood. And there you have it. Um, I take a Q-tip and kind of roll it along, soak up any of the uh, setting solution that's around it, kind of dry it a little bit. And you can see it dries fairly quickly. it's fairly dry then we're going to use the solvent try and get just enough on there to kind of flatten it out and very lightly flatten this out don't want to play with it too much because it can move Another reason you don't want to 
spend too much time with the cotton is you can leave bits and pieces of the particles in it on the paint. You'll notice this part's been cleaned and blown dry so I don't want to get anything on there that's going to stick between this and the clear coat. But that's pretty much it. Okay, so we're ready to go for the final clear coat. Um, I went through and cleaned everything really good. Uh, soaked it in some warm soapy water. Rinsed it off really good. Dried it with some compressed air. Um, reason being, we're going to be spraying final clear, so obviously anything that's on there is going to be trapped between your clear coat and your base coat, which once that happens, it's pretty much there. The only way to get rid of it is to sand it out and start all over again. So you want to make sure at this point everything's clean, especially your work area. You don't want any dust or anything blowing around while you're spraying. I've changed the paper here, so it shouldn't be a problem. Um, the final buffing stage of this, I go through roughly, I think it's four or five different grits. I have a, a buffing kit that I'll show you guys later that uh, goes from, I believe, 3200 grit all the way up to 12,000 grit, which is really, really super fine. Um, we're not going to use all of them. Uh, I don't think that it's going to be necessary at this point. Uh, the polishing compound that I use on this is actually pretty good. It's got a pretty good cut to it. So uh, I usually only go up to about 6,000 on the grit for this. So uh, with that in mind, what you're going to want to do here, and it might sound crazy to some people, is we're going to lay down roughly, I would venture, I guess, to say at least four coats of clear. Um, if you aren't going to go through the buffing process, it's going to be very excessive. You don't want to put down that much clear on these because obviously it's going to get the part a lot thicker and you're going to run into clearance issues later. Um, at this point, if you aren't going to buff, I would say no more than two coats and you can be done with it. I would do one tack coat to, uh, to lock in all your, your detail work. Um, you see I already went through and hit the side markers, uh, I finished off the badge on the front, and if you put a wet coat over those, it can reactivate whatever it is you use to paint, and it'll run and drip off, and it'll look horrible, um, and also your, your decal can curl if you put it on too wet, so you're going to do a tack coat first to seal those in and then a wet coat after that and like I said we're going to be doing probably I'm going to I think we can get away with four coats on this I don't want to put too much onto it but you saw earlier in the prep stage where that even that 1200 grit can take off the primer fairly quickly um, that's the reason why we put so much clear is because we're going to be sanding a lot of it off and we want a nice smooth glass like finish to this so you want to put enough to where you're not going to sand through into your base coat, but not too much to where you're going to create uh, clearance issues. So, um, I'll start with this one first. We're spraying again, still at 20 PSI. We're just going to do a really light coat, and you want to be very mindful of where you're spraying. Obviously, the edges don't need to be hit again. They're not going to be buffed. They're not going to be sanded. Um, Anywhere that's unable to be buffed, you want to really look at these really good before you start and make sure that you can buff it if you're going to lay down that much clear. If not, uh, again, no more than two coats because otherwise you're not going to be able to get it off. So I'm going to do real light first. Tack coat. Do another one. I'm 
Notice I'm not hitting edges anymore. At this point, it's not necessary. On this part, I'm going to go ahead and hit the black as well when I do this because that's going to get all clipped later. I'll go through, hit all of these, and come back for the second coat. Okay, ready for coat number two. Uh, we're gonna go a little heavier now. Tack coat's dried pretty well. Usually wait about 15, 20 minutes in between coats. Um, for the wetter coats, you're gonna use more of your trigger. You know, with the tack coat, I'm maybe quarter pull. On these, I'm gonna go about three quarter. See, that's pretty wet. I don't want a whole lot more than that or it'll start to run. But if you weren't going to buff, like I said before, you could stop here and that would be good enough. Um, it's got a little bit of orange peel right now, but it is going to settle more. So, I keep going. Um, these parts right here, for example, they're, they're a little tougher to buff. I'll probably just coat these right now for the second time and set them aside. Um, I don't know, the smaller edges like that, you run the risk of uh, sanding through the clear and getting into your base coat, which you don't want to do. So, I'll go ahead and coat these real quick and put them away. See, one good wet coat. That's all that needs. Get the other one. And this, I believe, is another one. I'm going to put some all clad. This is actually the, the inside of the headlight that goes underneath the clear lens. So I'm going to put that in all clad later. So I'll give this one a good one as well. And then the rest you just go through the same way. Give it a good white coat and then we'll let them sit for about 15-20 minutes and come back for number three. Okay. Here we are for number three. Uh, kind of nice too. Uh, a replacement actually just showed up in between coats, so I got my part now, and I can keep on going. So, I'll go ahead and shoot coat number three down now. You see that the gloss is starting to settle a little bit more now. Um, it's only minor orange peel, like I said, if you wanted to stop here you could, but I'm going to buff, so obviously I'm going to keep going. Now you can 
you see it's nice and glossy. The little guys here. Should be able to get a good look at how wet I'm laying it now. Um, again, not too heavy with your coats. Um, quick passes. Keeps it from getting drips and runs. You don't want that because trying to sand those out is a bit of a nightmare. Go in and come back to number four. And last clip. Now this this coat you're gonna notice that it's obviously it's really thick. Um, that's where the buffing will come in. It'll smooth everything out. Ideally, you don't want to be this thick when you're making a finished custom that you're not going to buff. And again, spray it, you know, fairly wet, but not enough to where it's going to run and leave drips at your edges. the fourth coat. So I'm going to go through and finish these up. Um, now that I have my canopy section, next I'll show you how I mask off, how I'm going to save the windows. Um, there's a couple little things that I like to do there, try and keep the, uh, the contrast with uh, the glass versus the, uh, the black weather stripping detail that's around this. So We'll get to that next and then after that we'll go to the third video in the series on the finish work so. okay so real quick on this canopy section um, I kind of decided to change uh, change up a little bit here uh, normally what I'll do and what I probably should have done with the other one but since it was damaged I was kind of not thinking like I normally would on these, but uh, normally what I like to do is to go ahead and paint the black on this first and then sand, you know, once I've masked off the spots that I want to keep black, then I'll go ahead and sand and remove it from the sections where it's going to be red. Um, but what I'm kind of thinking about doing here is since it's got this smoked glass to it, um, I think what I want to do is I want to make these almost like a satin not quite the high gloss on the black sections for the trim so I think the way that I can accomplish that what I'm going to do is I'm going to mask off this clear part so that it stays clear I'll still paint black underneath it but it'll look more smoked than it will be like a solid black so there will be a contrast still between the glass and the trim when I paint this so like I had mentioned before, I use this green frog tape. It's pretty good at resisting water so I can still wet sand and whatnot when I go through and do this. But what I'll do is try and get at least one line to match up to an existing line. And then again, I'll use my little crevice tool here, I call it, 
to smooth the tape into those joints. So I'll go ahead and define this all the way around. When you have, like this has with this little windshield wiper detail, um, sometimes you have to do some relief cuts around it. Add masking here and there to make it work. We'll see right now how well I can get this in there. But we'll push it up to that corner. I'll go ahead and trim this first one. See what we look like. Periodically try to remove some of the tape out of your way. It looks like it doesn't have a straight corner. So now we've got our little windshield wiper detail there. We're going to do a little bit at a time here to we work our way around it. try and get this all at once. Sometimes it takes a little bit of creative maneuvering to get around that. Trying not to cut into the windshield part. A lot of people ask me how I do this. It's just very painstaking sometimes. push it down to the other side just a little at a time work it in there Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap up the uh, paint section of this uh, video tutorial. Um, what I've done here, obviously now I've, I've got everything masked off. I went ahead and sprayed the black uh, around the windshield parts, uh, hit all the weather stripping, and then also the underside completely coated. Um, and then I'll give you a quick idea of why I did this. Oh. We're dropping stuff here. <laughs> so, I'm going to go ahead and remove this piece right here just so you can see. Very gently. So, I've got a little bit of a contrast you can kind of see. Um, not just with the gloss but also the color um, I went pretty light with the black underneath so it still has kind of a smoked look to it it's not going to be completely black and opaque which I think it'll give it a little bit of a cool uh, look to it once this is all clear coated and finished off um, but next what I'll do here um, 
and I don't think I need to run through this again but I'm gonna go through and mask up to this second line here on the weather stripping to cover that black so then I can come back and do my sanding on this. I'm gonna sand this to remove it rather than use alcohol. Um, I don't want to risk damaging this and have to buy another one again. So um, I can sand pretty easily most of this stuff right here. These little details like this, uh, you don't need to get too critical about them if you are concerned. Uh, I have mentioned before you can use the, uh, the uh, prep pen to sand those up. Um, it's not really critical that you do that. Nothing's going to touch. Um, so I'll go through and get this ready to go, get it primed, go through the same process I did with the rest of the red, and then uh, once I'm done with the red, I'll remove all the masking, I'll do a quick clear coat over the top of this, and then uh, I can probably roll right into final clear on this guy, get this thing ready and caught up with the rest of it, and then um, the only part I'm going to do different here is this black strip. Um, I'm thinking about doing that in a flat black when I do it. So I'll do that after final clear, before the buffing, and then I'll just mask it just so nothing gets on it while I'm buffing it out. And then uh, it'll have the contrast between the red and the flat black. I think it'll look kind of cool, something different. And that concludes the painting section of this tutorial. Uh, next up you guys will see, uh, I'll put one for the final finish work. Uh, I'll show you how to do the buffing and how I do my details and that should wrap this up